coming every Tuesday night in March at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live. It's the Bible is Black History Institute. This year's theme is Great Women of the Bible, Black Women Who Shaped Our Biblical Faith. We will study Eve, Deborah, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with Vashti, Esther, and Lydia. We will study from Dr. Theron Williams' latest book, Great Women of the Bible, Contemporary Conversations. To order your copy and for more information about the Bible is Black History Institute 2021, visit our website, BibleIsBlackHistory.com. Attention parents, starting in March, we will return to our books, Becoming a Young Woman of God and Becoming a Young Man of God. Our first study is titled Becoming Focused, Setting Goals, Focusing on Philippians 3.14 and Proverbs 14.12. Be sure your children join us every Thursday at 7 p.m., remembering always that their future is in your hands. If you have any questions, please contact Angela Wallace via email at Angela Wallace at Mount Carmel Indy.org. The Lilly Endowment has awarded a total of $17.2 million in grants to 38 organizations working to mitigate the adverse human and economic effects of the COVID-19 pandemic in Marion County. Because of Lilly Endowment's generous donation to the Mount Carmel Church, We are excited to announce the availability of funds to support the community through our benevolence program. We can provide assistance to those needing help with housing assistance, utilities, and other survival needs. To apply for this support, please visit our website, mountcarmelindy.org, to access the application form and other resources. Mount Carmel is partnering with IU Health to engage those who are experiencing social isolation. The Care Touch program will come alongside to help IU Health patients and Mount Carmel members and listen to their concerns, help them gain access to community resources, networks, and navigate systems. Training is provided by IU Health, and we'll be conducting another training in the upcoming weeks. Please contact the church at 317-890-2740, extension 12, or email Reverend Lola Bartlett at Lola Bartlett at Mount Carmel Indy.org to be a part of this great venture. Are you looking for a job or are you an employer and you want to post an open position? Then visit the Mount Carmel Job Board. You can view available jobs or you can create an account in order to post and edit positions. Go to Mount Carmel Indy.org under Community Initiatives. The Mount Carmel Wellness Groups are back. The pandemic has affected many of us in a variety of ways, straining our mental, physical, and emotional health. Mount Carmel is providing support to manage the additional stresses during this time by offering weekly wellness support groups through video and audio conferencing. If you're interested in joining a weekly discussion group, please go to our website, mountcarmelindy.org, to register or call the church at 317-890-2740. For condolences and prayer requests, be sure to visit our prayer wall on our website, mountcarmelindy.org. God has been so good to me. If he never does another thing, he's already done more than I'm worthy of. I I don't need another reason. All that is in me, I've got to praise you now. Praise the Lord, Mount Carmel, and welcome Mount Carmel friends and family. I am so glad that you are able to gather with us today, and I know that you just cannot wait for the great word that God has given our pastor, Theron Williams, and to come in and to join in in the praise and worship with Minister Lamar Campbell and Tanya, Tanya, and Tanya. But before we get into the worship, Remember that today is Communion Sunday, and don't forget your communion elements. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father God, for today. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father God. 
We thank you, Lord God, for another opportunity to come before, to come in your presence, Father God, and lift up holy hands and tell you hallelujah and thank you, Jesus, Father God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for another time, another opportunity to come together and worship you, Heavenly Father. We pray that you would bless these services, that you would bless the man of God who is going to preach your word, that you would bless those who are going to sing your praises, Heavenly Father. Father, and I pray that you would bless every home, Father God, where your word is being proclaimed. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How many know that our great God is awesome? Come on, wake up this morning with your praise and your hallelujah. Come on, why don't you declare it right in the comment section this morning. Lord, you are awesome. Come on, if he's been good, if he's been faithful, if he's been a holy God, somebody shout glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. I don't know about you, but I feel all right this morning. Come on, time, you're just singing together.
house of God to praise this morning. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Glory to Jesus! Glory, 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 glory! Nobody like him. Let us now prepare to worship our God through communion. Jesus said, and as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And we come now to remember his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his suffering. Let us pray. Father, we come right now to say thank you for how good you are. As we reflect upon the life, the passion, the suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he suffered on our behalf, suffered in our place. And we have come together to commemorate that suffering and to celebrate what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would bless these elements, this wafer and this juice that represents the spilled blood and broken body of Jesus Christ. God, we pray that we would examine ourselves lest we eat damnation to our own souls. It is in the precious name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. And on that night, Jesus and the 12 sat together in the upper room and Jesus took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is broken for you, eat ye all of it. And after he took the wine, he said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Drink ye all of it. And after they sang a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Lord, we thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I love being able to come together in worship with God's people. As we continue in worship, please be in prayer for Sister Sophia Harlan and family as they continue to mourn the loss of her son, Anthony Carlos Neely. Services was yesterday. Did you miss sending in your birthday notice? We, we have three birthdays, so I want to wish happy birthday to Sister Odessa Beeler. Happy birthday, Sister Odessa. And Brother Oscar Marquez, happy birthday. And the man behind the camera, happy birthday, Richard Gilliam. Happy birthday. We had a good time last month with our combined classes. If you weren't there, you missed a treat. So today, we start back in our regularly scheduled classes. So if you forgot your class call-in information, please make sure to look at your email. Also, if you've been missing Tuesday's Bible study, you've been missing a treat. We have been studying from Pastor Williams' Bible is Black History, Great Women of the Bible, a contemporary conversation. Make sure you join us each Tuesday at 7 p.m. Also, make sure you get your book. All right, let's get back to worship.
Oh, <laughs> 
I want to call your attention to the first book of the Kings, Kings chapter 17, starting at verse 7. Here's how it reads. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, Elisha, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Zidon and stay there. I have prepared a widow to sustain you there. So he went up to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow there was gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Will you please bring me a little water in a jar so that I may drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, And please bring me a piece of bread. Surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. And I am gathering a few sticks to take them home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Elisha said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me and bring me what you have. And then make something for yourself and for your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. The jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the Lord sends rain to the earth. So she went away and did as Elisha had told her. So there was enough food every day for Elisha and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elisha. And as we celebrate Women's Month, this month of March, I want to start off by talking from the topic, when women get involved, when women get involved. What would this world be without the involvement of great women? What would our community be without the involvement of women? What would our families be? What would our churches be without the involvement of great women? Living in a male patriarchal toxic society, women have not gotten the proper recognition that they deserve for the many contributions they have made for the betterment of society at large. James Brown said, this is a man's world, but it would be nothing without a woman or a girl. And we give brothers the recognition, and we should. We give men recognition that they deserve. I mean, we hold up Moses as the great liberator lawgiver. And we should hold up Moses. I mean, after all, for crying out loud, he is Moses. I mean, he is the great liberator. He is the great lawgiver. He is the one who established the foundation upon which the entire Judaism religion is built. He is Moses, and he deserved the recognition and all of the accolades that biblical and secular history have given to Moses. But you cannot talk about Moses long without talking about the women who influenced his life. You can't talk about Moses long without talking about Jacobed, his mother, who came to Moses' rescue when Moses was a little boy, when the Egyptian power sought 
to annihilate boys like baby Moses. Without Jochebed, I doubt we would even know who Moses was. It is Jochebed who made a vessel out of reed and pitched and put Moses in that vessel and allowed him to float down the Nile River to the place where she knew that Pharaoh's daughters would be bathing. All the while, his sister, perhaps Miriam, was watching over the basket to make sure nothing happens to it. And when that basket finally reached the place where Pharaoh's daughters were bathing, it is Moses' sister, perhaps Miriam, who went to uh, Pharaoh's daughters as they marveled over the beauty of this Hebrew child. And she asked them, do you want me to go find a Hebrew woman to be the nanny for this boy? Pharaoh's daughter thought that that would be a great idea. So she goes and gets Jochebed, Moses' mother. And for the next 40 years, Moses, Jochebed, and perhaps Miriam, Moses' sister, spent under the leadership and in authority and in the household of Pharaoh. Oh, we can talk about the great men, but what about the great women without whose involvement a lot of this stuff would have never happened. Oh, we can celebrate Solomon. Solomon was a great man and he is worthy of celebration. Solomon was one of the greatest kings in Israelitic history. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. But you can't talk much about Solomon without talking about his mother Bathsheba. As a matter of fact, we applaud Solomon for his intellect, for his wisdom, and it is now a genetic fact that children get their intelligence and their wisdom and their smarts from their mother. So if Moses was brilliant, guess where he got it from? He got it from his mother, Bathsheba. That's why I tell brothers all the time, if you want to have smart children, you better find yourself a smart woman. For the children inherit their intellect from their mothers. And when King David was on his dying bed, and when everybody was jockeying for position as to who would succeed David as the next king of Israel, it was Bathsheba who was behind the scene pulling strings and maneuvering politically to make sure that her son Solomon succeeds David as the third king of Israel's history. Oh, we can talk about the great men but we also have to say a word about the great women who made all of this happen. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. He is God in the flesh. But when God decided to enter into human history, God decided to use this young Afro-Semitic woman named Mary through whom he would enter into human history. It is Mary that he chose to take care of him as a child and to nurture and to grow him so that he can mature to become the savior of the world that God intended for him to be. Yeah, James Brown, it is a man's world, but it would be nothing without a woman or a girl. And consider all of the women who came alongside Jesus's ministry to help make the Jesus movement what it had mushroom and blossom uh, to become. You can look at Mary Magdalene and you can look at Mary, his mother. You can look at Susanna and you can look at Joanna. All of these women that are listed in the gospel according to St. Mark chapter eight, we find this, 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 this crowd of women, this collection of women, this gathering of women, this, this fellowship, this community of women who came alongside and ministered to the Jesus movement out of their substance. My brothers and sisters, what would this world be? What would this society be without the involvement of great women? When we look at our own past, when we look at our own history, when the enslaved Africans needed a way out of slavery, then came Harriet Tuckman with the Underground Railroad. 
when people didn't think black people could learn, when broader society didn't think black people could learn and didn't have the intellect, didn't have the intelligence, didn't have the, the, the intellectual bandwidth to be able to understand the complex ideals and philosophies. It is Mary MacLeod Bethune who thought differently that black people can learn. And so it is she that helped to establish an HBCU so that black people can get training beyond high school. And when the civil rights movement needed someone to kick it off, it was a woman named Rosa Parks who refused to give up her seat on the bus. And when children needed an advocate so that we can proclaim to the world that kids are people too and that children have to have the attention that they need to grow and to flourish and they should not be uh, subjected to second class citizenship. Then came Mary Wright Edelton to help push through legislation on behalf of children. And when Joe Biden needed a running mate to pull him over the political finish line so that he can become the 46th president of the United States, he called on Kamala Harris a black woman to come alongside to cement and to secure the black minority and the women vote that would help make Joe Biden the 46th president of the United States. It is indeed a man's world, James Brown, but it would be nothing without a woman or a girl. Where would Elisha's ministry had been? What would have happened to Elisha's ministry? were it not for the involvement of this widow, this woman at Zarephath. What would have come of it? What would have become of Elijah's prophetic ministry if he had not run into, come into contact, enter into relationship with this widow, this woman, who made such a difference in Elijah's ministry that she breathed new life into Elijah's flailing ministry to set the trajectory so that Elijah could go to another level in his service for God. It is impressive at how God brought these two people together. Uh, it, is, it is God who brought them together to form this relationship so that this relationship could breathe new life into Elijah's ministry that God brought these two people together on the basis of need because when you look at this thing, you'll discover that their relationship, their connection was sovereignly staged. Because at the beginning of chapter 17, we see Elisha, he's at the brook Sherith and the Lord is sustaining him there. The ravens are bringing bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he's drinking from the babbling brook while the rest of society is enduring a severe famine. But the record is that the brook dried up, and the ravens stopped coming, and God spoke to Elisha. He said to Elisha, go up to Zarephath, check it out, because I have prepared a widow to sustain you there. I told him to go up to Zarephath because I have sustained not a millionaire. I have prepared not a rich person. I have prepared not someone from the aristocracy, but I have prepared a widow, somebody at the bottom of the economic ladder. I have prepared a widow to sustain you there. And it is God who facilitates this coming together, who facilitates this relationship, this, this connection. And my brothers and sisters, God is the great matchmaker. It is God who navigates people in and out of our lives for the purpose of relationships where one can pour into the other and the other can pour into the one. Relationships were designed to be mutual and God brought them together. And you would think that God would have sent Elijah to some rich person, to some person in power, but God sent him to this widow. God is the great matchmaker. And so many times we miss our blessing because we don't appreciate the package the blessing comes wrapped up in. 
I mean, and this is instructive for all relationships. It's instructive for platonic relationships, for romantic relationships, familiar relationships, ecclesiastical relationships, for uh, professional relationships, for, uh, for occupational relationships. All of these relationships should be sovereignly staged. God has a way of bringing people into our lives in every area so that there can be mutual pouring into one another. God brought this man and this woman together. God brought them together. It was, it was sovereignly staged. And we can't get so wrapped up in the package that the person comes in that we exclude and dismiss that person because we could be missing out on something or on a relationship uh, that can prove to be deeply meaningful to us because we don't like the package. He wrapped Elisha's package up. He wrapped his blessing up in a widow, a poor, disadvantaged, marginalized widow. And I'm so glad that, that Elisha did not ignore her. I'm so glad uh, that, that Elisha accepted what God had given to him regardless of the package it came wrapped up in. And beloved, I have gotten some awesome gifts as a matter of fact, one time, one of the best gifts I ever received was wrapped up in newspaper. It was a box wrapped up in newspaper with a bow on it. I opened it and to my surprise and much delight, it was an awesome gift. And there have been other gifts that were not so awesome that came wrapped up in the most beautiful wrapping paper money could buy. Don't pay too much attention to what the blessing comes wrapped up in, but let's pay attention to the content. NFL superstar, Hall of Fame wide receiver Jerry Rice went to Mississippi Valley State University, a small HBCU. I think when Jerry Rice was playing, it was a D3 school. And Jerry Rice was burning him up. He was tearing up the league. Everybody was talking about Jerry Rice and number 80. He was the man. But his school just so happened not to put the name of the player on the back of the jersey, just the number. Jerry Rice is number 80 and he is killing. And so the opposing team devised a scheme. Their whole defensive scheme was to shut down number 80, Jerry Rice. The day of the came came and number 80 was triple, doubled and triple covered to make sure he set, shut down. But number 71 on the other side, the other wide receiver was having a stellar game, caught several passes for several yards and scored several touchdowns. And Mississippi Valley State won the game. While everybody is focusing on number 80, number 71 was ripping them apart. What had happened was, was that Mississippi Valley State understood that the focus would be on number 80, so they switched jerseys. They took number 80 and gave it to the lesser talented wide receiver and took number 71 and gave it to Jerry Rice. And so while everybody was focusing on the package, number 80, it is Jerry Rice and number 71 who is killing the defense. Let's not get too carried away by the package. It is not so much what the gift come wrapped up in. It is the content. It is the substance. It is the essence of the gift. Don't miss what God has for you because you don't like what it came wrapped in. During World War I, there was a man very intelligent who had gone to the library to check out a book. And when he checked out the book, he discovered the book was brand new. It had only been read by one person previous to him. And as he read through the book, he was more uh, enthralled by the notes that had been written in the margin by the previous person who had checked out the book. And he's reading in this beautiful handwriting all of this profound stuff that this person had written in the book. And based upon the handwriting, he was sure that this handwriting was of a woman. 
he went to the back of the book and he saw the library card and it was a woman who had checked out this book and had written this profound thoughts in the margins of the book. He took the book back to the library and he knew the librarian and he begged the librarian to give him the number of this wonderful woman who had just captivated him with her mentality, with her thoughts, with how smart she was based upon the entries she had made in the margin of the book. The librarian did it, gave him the phone number and he called the woman and said to the woman how, how impressed he was with her intellect and he wanted to meet her. They prepared to meet, but before they got a chance to meet in person, he got called off to the war, World War I. Immediately, he had to go and enlist, get on a plane and go to where the fight was. While he was away, he and the woman kept in touch by letters. They wrote each other two or three times a week and she would write back to him and she would put perfume on the letter and send it back to him and they corresponded with each other throughout the time he was away at war. He fell in love with her through her letters wrote her one letter and said to her, send me a picture of you because I want to see the woman with whom I fell in love. She wrote back to him and said, if you love me, the way I look should not matter. He agreed. Finally, he had a chance to come home and he wrote her and let her know that he was coming home on leave from the army and that he wanted her to, he wanted her to meet him at Grand Central Station, the train station at six o'clock on Monday. She said, I will be there, but you will know who I am because I'll be wearing a red uh, a knitted uh, uh, scarf with a matching red knitted hat, bright red, you won't miss me. And I'll be there to meet you because I know you're going to have on your military uniform and I can't wait to meet you. The man was excited and he got on the plane and when on, on the train rather. And when he got to his destination at six o'clock Grand Central Station, the train doors opened, and he stepped off a beautiful Halle Berry type Beyonce type woman walked past him and smiled at him and raised her eyebrows and said to him in a very seductive manner, going my way, soldier. The soldier was excited, elated, and turned to follow the beautiful woman. But behind the woman stood an older woman who Father Time had come and taken his chisel and cut lines in her face and Mother Nature had come and took her paintbrush and color her hair white and uh, time and gravity had caused her shoulders to st stoop beneath the weight of the years. She was a woman with a shopping cart in front of her and bags on the side of her. She was a bag lady, but she had on the bright red scarf and she had on the bright matching uh, 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 hat that matched the scarf. And so he's torn. Should I go with the woman that I've fallen in love with or should I follow Beyonce? And so he's torn. But his heart said, I need to go with the woman that I have fallen in love with. He walks over to her and he introduces himself and he says to her, I'm James. And the lady says to him, I don't know what game you young people are playing. But someone gave me five dollars and told me to put this scarf and cap on. And if you came to me and introduced yourself, she told me to tell you to meet her across the street at the cafe and you will know who the woman is because she was the woman who walked past you and asked you, go in my way, soldier. The man ran across the street to the cafe to meet the woman with whom he had fallen in love. And that long story is only to say to you, we must never reject the gift based upon the package it comes wrapped up in. My brothers and sisters, here is this, this man and this woman, uh, this widow at Zarephath and Elisha. It was sovereignly staged. They came together on the basis of need, sovereignly staged. But beloved, every relationship is not sovereignly staged. There are some that are satanically staged. 
And we know that because we can look at that paradoxical personality of the Old Testament named Samson, uh, who was so smart that he could baffle the uh, wise men and the sages of his day with his riddles. And yet he was so stupid that he couldn't see through the plot of an evil woman. Now that Moses was a paradox. He was so fast that he could run and chase down foxes and tie their tails together. But he was so slow that he could not see through the plot and the rules of an evil woman. That he was so strong that he could defeat an army of men with just a jawbone of a beast of burden. And yet he was so weak that he could not resist the seduction of a woman. He went down to the valley of Sorek, the Bible says, and he fell in love with a woman named Delilah. And his relationship with Delilah would prove to be his end because when he hung out with Delilah, he ended up blind and in chains. It is Samson that entered into a relationship that was satanically staged. And we know it's satanically staged because when you read the record, the Bible said, and Samson went down to Sorek, to the valley of Sorek, to connect with Delilah. But when you read about Elisha, it says, and Elisha went up to Zarephath and he connected with the widow. One went down to connect and the other went up to connect. Samson went down to the valley of Sorek to connect with his uh, mate. Uh, uh, Elisha went up to, the, uh, to, to Zarephath to connect with the woman. That's how you know if it's sovereignly staged or satanically staged. Whenever you have to go down to connect. It's probably satanically stays. Whenever you have to go beneath your morals, beneath your ethic, more, beneath your morals, beneath your spiritual values to connect with somebody, it is probably satanically stays. But when you have to go up to connect with somebody, go up to somebody whose values are higher than yours, up to somebody whose ethic is higher than yours, up to somebody whose mores are higher than yours, up with somebody who was interested in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and who are filled with the spirit and trying to become all that God is calling them to be. Elisha went up to connect. Uh, uh, Samson went down to connect. Samson ended up buried beneath a pile of rubble, blind and in chains. But Elisha went up and he went to the next level and he went on to do what God had called him to do. This relationship was sovereignly staged. But not only was it sovereignly staged, it was also a sharing of substance. Because before they came together, the Bible said that God had prepared this woman for Elisha. And Zarephath was not around the corner from the uh, from Brook Sherrod. It took a while for Elisha to get there. And while Elisha is on his way to Zarephath, God is working on him. God had prepared the widow before Elisha came into her life. And God had prepared Elisha before the widow came into his life. It was a period of preparation so that when you are by yourself, that's the time to allow God to prepare you for the next thing that comes into your life. It's a time of preparation. You might be between jobs and looking for a job and waiting for your next employment, professional, occupational relationship. But while you are waiting, allow God to prepare you for it. You may be in between relationships and waiting for God to send the next person into your life. But while you are waiting, allow God to prepare you for it. You may be between friendships and looking for a meaningful platonic friendship that God can bring into your life. But while you're by yourself, allow God to prepare you for it. You may even be between churches, may have left the church that you once attended and looking for another church that you can attend. And while you are between churches, allow God to prepare you for the next thing that comes into your life. It takes preparation. That's why when Elisha shows up, she was ready for him. And when uh, Elisha showed up, Elisha was ready for her. That's how they hit it off. That's why it clicked so quickly, because God had prepared both of them and they met 
on the basis of need. Elijah had a need. It was for food. It was for water. It was for housing. The widow had a need. It was for the word of God. It was spiritual and it was for her own son. Because if you keep reading this passage, you'll find that the widow woman's son died. Thank God Elijah was there. Because when you read it closely, the Bible said that Elijah took the boy up to his room, meaning Elijah's room in her house, laid him across his bed, meaning Elijah's bed in her house and resuscitated the dead boy back to life. Elijah had a room and a bed in this woman's house. It was a a, a relationship built upon mutual needs. Elijah was pouring into her and she was pouring in to Elisha. And that's what relationships are all about. But we live in an age where people are so concerned about themselves. What can they get out of it? How much can they get out of a relationship without ever thinking about how can I pour into a relationship? And when you got relationships that are lopsided, when you have a relationship where there is no reciprocity, you really don't have a relationship. You have an arrangement. And in most arrangements, somebody is getting used. But there ought to be mutual sharing. It ought to be mutual people pouring into each other. That's the nature and the function and the basis of relationships. And that's how, how we, many of us, have our relationship with God. It's based upon what God can do for us. And I think it has a lot to do with the basis of how we understand basic Christianity. I was reading a book just the other day by uh, one of the pillars, one of the great thinkers, one of the sages of evangelical theology, John R. W. Stotts. He has a book called Basic Christianity. And in that book, Basic Christianity, he seeks to deal with the basic fundamental principles of Christianity in his mind, the way he thinks for him, what Christianity is all about. And John R. W. Stotts has a passage in that book that says in this book, we do not intend to talk about the philosophy, the theology or the teaching of Jesus, because these are not central to the basic Christian message. But the death, the burial, and the resurrection are central. So we will not be talking about in this book, Jesus' philosophies, Jesus' principle, Jesus' teaching, Jesus' words, but we will be focusing on his death and his burial and his resurrection. Indeed, the death, burial, and the resurrection is center of the Christian message, but also center to the Christian message is Jesus's philosophy, Jesus's teaching, Jesus's theology. They are all combined. You cannot separate them because when you separate them, all of the focus is on Jesus as a blood sacrifice for your sins. So that the only thing you become interested in is what can Jesus do for me to keep me out of hell? So if that's your focus, Jesus becomes nothing but a blood sacrifice for you. And one author said that we have developed a bunch of vampire Christians because all we are concerned about is the blood of Jesus. And the only reason we are concerned about the blood of Jesus is because we have been taught it's because that is what's going to keep us out of hell. So it becomes personal. It becomes selfish. It becomes a question of what can Jesus do for me personally? And when that's your foundation, why not have a relationship with God that's based upon what can God do for me? If the foundation of your faith is what can Christ do for me on Calvary and not what I can pour back into Christ, then the duration of your Christian pilgrimage is going to be based on what can God do for me without me doing anything for God. 
That we see God as a cosmic genie that we rub the lamp and he comes hopscotching across eternity to grant us our wishes. And then when God gives us what we want, we turn our backs on him and proceed with life as usual. And if that's how you deal with Christ, if that's how you deal with God, why would it be any different in how you deal with God's church? Don't you know that when you enter into a relationship with the, when you join the church, you have entered into what I call an ecclesiastical relationship. You are in relationship with that church. The church pours into you spiritually. The church pours into you psychologically. The church pours into you theologically and sometimes pours into you materially. The church is pouring into people and people in return, if you understand the nature of relationship, have an obligation to pour back into the church. That's how it works. But we have a generation who only wants to take and never wants to give. And if that's who you are, if that's where you are, it is no wonder your relationships never work. They never work platonically, they never work romantically, they never work familiarly, they never work professionally, they never work occupationally, they never work spiritually, they never work. Because you can't do all the taking and not do any giving. Relationships are cyclical. You pour in and you receive. Several years ago, I was on my way home from the office and when I left my office, it was a snowstorm and the snow was so thick, I turned on my lights. It was only four o'clock in the day. I turned on my lights on my cars to try to break through uh, the density of the snow. And like all of us, you know, when it snows or when there is a catastrophe, the first thing we do is run to the store buy a bunch of food, a bunch of water, a bunch of toilet tissue. You know how we do. And I, like everybody else, it was snowing and I knew we were going to be snowed in and I knew we were going to be bunkered in. So before I went home, I stopped at the grocery store and I got out of my car and went into the store and I was in the store for more than two hours. That's how crowded the store was. Went in there to get what I thought that I would need to help me make it through um, the, uh, to help me make it through the, uh, the, 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 the snow season. And when I came out of the, the store, I went into my car. And when I got into my car, put the key in, turned the key over, and my car wouldn't start. And I forgot to turn my lights off. And I'm in the store for a couple of hours, and I discovered that the lights had drain my battery to the point that I could not start my car. So I opened my hood and I opened my trunk and I took my cables out and I stood in front of my car hoping that somebody would recognize who I am and give me a jump. And as my car hood was open and someone came and said, Pastor, you need a jump? I said, yes, I do. And as I connected the cables to his car and to my car, my alternator started talking to me. Alternator had a word for me. The alternator said, the reason you can't start your car is because your battery is drained. And I said, duh, that's why I'm out getting a jump. He said, but there is nothing wrong with your battery. The reason your battery is drained is because check out your alternator. Your alternator has something to say to you. The alternator said to me, the reason your battery is drained is because you left the lights on and the lights were draining your battery without a mechanism to replenish and to restore the energy that the battery had expended. He said, my job as the alternator, that when your car starts, you literally deplete the battery of all of this energy. But the engine has a way of putting the energy back into the battery. And that's how it works. I'm the alternator. I take energy from the, from the engine and put it back into the battery. 
so that the battery can be a blessing to you. That's why you can run your radio. That's why you can turn your lights on because the alternator is always taking energy from the engine and giving it to the battery. But when you left out of your car, what you did was is that you left the lights on without a mechanism to re-energize the battery. That's why you can't get started because you're in a non-reciprocal relationship. The battery is taking from the, the lights are taken from the battery without a mechanism to re-empower the battery. That's why when you stick the key in, it can't get started. And friends, that's why many of our relationships are so jacked up. That's why they can't get started. That's why they don't have any energy. And when we talk about the church, that's probably one of the reasons that the church can't get started. The church can't move forward because it's often crowded with people who are taken without giving back. When you take from the church, whether it's spiritual stuff or mental stuff or psychological stuff or even material stuff or theological stuff, when the church pours out to you, you ought to be pouring back into the church to keep it going there was a sharing of substance but not only was there a sharing of substance and not only was this relationship sovereignly staged but there was also in the final instance supernatural satisfaction I like that because the Bible said and the meal never the, the barrel never uh, ran out of meal and the cruise never failed of this oil. It kept going. <laughs> it kept giving supernatural satisfaction. See, natural satisfaction only lasts for a season. It, it wears off. Natural satisfaction is if I get thirsty and I go get a drink of water, it's going to quench my thirst and satisfy me, but only for a little while. If I'm hungry, I'll go get something to eat and that'll satisfy me only for a little while because I'm going to get hungry again. If I'm tired and I go to bed and I get some rest, that's going to satisfy uh, my fatigue, but only for a little while because I'm going to get tired again. But supernatural satisfaction is a satisfaction that lasts throughout the duration. And I like that because of this relationship with, 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 with Elisha and the widow it ran out because if you keep reading, Elisha leaves her life never to see her again. And the truth is, beloved, all relationships in all of them, uh, they're not supernatural. They don't provide supernatural satisfaction. All relationships in either somebody's going to walk out of your life or somebody's going to lay down and die on you. Nevertheless, all relationships at some point will come to an end. But there is one relationship that starts in time and will move throughout eternity. And that's my relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because it's supernatural satisfaction. God satisfies me on this side of the Jordan and he will continue to be my God and my source of strength and satisfaction on the other side of the Jordan. He's my God. He's my God. He's my sense of satisfaction. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. That's my word to you this morning, beloved. That when women get involved, great things begin to happen. Hallelujah for the Lamb of God. The door of God's church is open. If there's one today and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and your personal Savior. You have an opportunity right now to receive Christ and be saved. If you're here and you never said yes to the Lord, you can take care of that right now, right here. Our God is an awesome God and our God is worthy to be praised. Uh, if you've never said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ, You've never been baptized. Christ is not a part of your life. We can take care of that right now. Romans 10 verse 10 said, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shall be saved. And if you've never been saved, pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, come into my life for the forgiveness of my sins. 
I believe you died on Calvary. I believe you rose again on the third day. I believe you are the Lord. Will you come into my life, be my Lord and be my savior? If you prayed that prayer, beloved, you are saved and welcome to the family of God. Now you're gonna need a church home. And I invite you to be a part of the Mount Carmel Church Home. This is the church making disciples for the Lord Jesus Christ. You need a place where you can come, where you can grow in your discipleship to the Lord Jesus Christ, where you can grow to become what God wants you to be. And we invite you to be a part of the Mount Carmel Church. It's easy to be a part of this church. You can go to our website and you can shoot us a, um, uh, an email to inform us that you want to be a part of this church. Our website is on your screen. Uh, our website address is on the screen. You can go to the website and um, you can let us know that you want to be a part of this church and our uh, evangelism team will walk you through the onboarding process so that you can become a member of this wonderful, wonderful ministry. God bless you and may the Lord continue to keep you. Let's worship our God through giving. Amen. Amen. We recognize what we're trying to accomplish here. We talk in our message about pouring into people and pouring into communities and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to affect change in our community. And we have the E3 project where we are going to be dealing with the food desert and the food insecurity but we're going to be dealing with the education desert and education insecurity. And we'll be dealing with the economic desert and the economic insecurity. We're trying to facilitate uh, that, that process here at the Mount Carmel Church. But we can't do it without resources. We can't do it without time. We can't do it without offering. And the word of God has already outlined how his ministry is to be funded through the benevolence and the generosity of his people whom he has blessed. And so we do encourage you to give that the Lord has blessed you. Uh, we always say traditionally in the church, you can't be God given. And so we do encourage you to give liberally. And I wanna thank those who have been liberal in their giving uh, as we try to navigate our way through this pandemic. You have been liberal and generous and beneficent in your giving and we thank God for you. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come right now to say thank you for income, for increase, for resources. We pray, God, that you would bless us at the point of our needs and that you would be a blessing to us as we seek to pour into the kingdom of God. You are no shorter than your word that when we give to you, you give back to us so that we'll be in a position to give to you again. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You can give through our Secure Give app. You can go click on that app, it'll walk you through. You can give secondly through um, our website. Again, mountcarmelindy.org. You can click on the link and it'll walk you through. You can give by text. You can give by text and that number is on your screen. And when you give through text, you can write in the amount, type in the amount you wanna give and then put give and that'll go to us. Or you can do it the old fashioned way put it in the mail, send it to the address listed on your screen, Mount Carmel Church, 9610 East 42nd Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46235. We should be sure to get it and use it to the glory of God. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the communion of the Holy Ghost and the love of God rest, rule and abide with each and every one of us henceforth now and forever. Amen. Coming every Tuesday night in March at 7 p.m. on Facebook Live, it's the Bible is Black History Institute. This year's theme is Great Women of the Bible, Black Women Who Shaped Our Biblical Faith. We will study Eve, Deborah, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, along with Vashti, Esther, and Lydia. We will study from Dr. Theron Williams' latest book, Great Women of the Bible, Contemporary Conversations. To order your copy and for more information about the Bible is Black History Institute 2021, visit our website, BibleIsBlackHistory.com.